Good evening and uh, welcome to this fourth Rage Result online webinar. Uh, this one is going to sound a bit more French than British uh, because tonight Elliot is taking a bit of a break, but he's still right next to me, ready to answer all your questions on the chat. Tonight we're going to look into event setup best practices, uh, which are principles which will help you to make your uh, event setups efficient and coherent and easy to operate for you and your staff. Um, as a former colleague of us used to say, uh, there's many ways to skin a cat. So tonight what I'm going to show you is principles I apply um, when setting up events and then you can decide what makes sense and what you want to apply for your events. So, um, tonight's presentations will be around four main points. Um, the contest and participants data structure, um, how to use user-defined fields and functions, how to set up your timing points, results, and rank structure, and how to set up your output lists and online results. So, let's look at contests first. Contests are usually a group of participants who start at the same time, perform the same course, and are ranked together. So that's pretty easy if you have a 5km race starting at 10am and a 10km race starting at 10am, uh, then you just create one contest per distance and you're done. But there's some events where it's not that easy and you need to decide which structure makes sense. Let's take a precise example. Um, guess which? This is a two-day multi-sport event um, with on day one just a kid duathlon with wave start per age group. And on the second day, we've got an elite men and women race um, and an open event with the triathlon and duathlon. Uh, starting at the same time um, and each of these triathlon and duathlons have an individual and a relay uh, contest. So looking at this you need to decide first um, if you put everything in one file or maybe if you want to create one file per day, day one and day two, or maybe even three files, one for the, duath the kids duathlon, one for the elite and one for uh, the open event. Um, then for the kids, you need to decide, do I put everyone in one contest or um, do I just and create wave starts per age group or do I create um, one contest per category, for example. Um, here, there's no definite right or wrong. In the end, it's a question of um, of how you um, of how you want the results to look like and how easy to operate it needs to be. Okay, so here I would just like to show you what I did on that event. So this is Triathlon de Valence in my hometown, and I went for four contests. Okay, so I, each of the elite events gets his own contest. And then for the open triathlon and duathlon uh, individual and relay, I just created one contest, which I called open. And for the kids duathlon, um, I just put everyone in one contest as well. Then, um, because I'm not grouping per contest there, I needed some other ways of grouping. Uh, participants to get their start times. So, start times here, out of our four contests, I made one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten waves based on a user defined field and function, um, which I'll come back to later. Okay, and then in the results, The 
Grand Prix results are based per contest. And then in the open, are just grouped per triathlon men, women mixed, and duathlon when men, women, and relay. The kids are grouped by age group. All right. Now to our second point, data fields, okay? So setting up an event, you need to decide which data you need from the participants to be able to uh, produce all the results and ranks um, that you need. Setting up the fields, um, you need to remember to um, keep the field names simple in the back end. So here we are going to uh, swap to the triathlon example, which you can find in the knowledge base, and you can actually download that exact file if you want to have a look at it later. So, of course, you'll set up the default fields, and then you can have some additional um, text fields, and some additional yes no fields so um, first thing i would advise you to do is to use yes no fields wisely so anything that is um, a yes or no question um, you should set up as a yes no rather than a text field and for example um, do participant want a t-shirt then that would be a yes no field when I mean uh, keep field names simple in the back end, um, maybe in your online registration, you'll want to offer an, a red Adidas shirt for 15 euro extra. Okay. Well, if you want to display that in uh, the online registration, you can just keep the field simple in the back end. And then here in your form fields, just add your t-shirt with a label. All right. Then once you have a t-shirt, you're likely to need the size. Okay, then set it up as an additional text field an, uh, associated with the yes, no, so that they're displayed next to one another here, and you'll need some preset values so people don't just choose things that are not available. All right. Um, last point on the list was to set up fields that depend on others, so other sets of da data as user-defined fields. Okay, I'll tell you more about user-defined de fields right away. So what are user-defined fields and what can you use them for? You can use them to calculate values instead of setting them manually. You can simplify expressions uh, that come often throughout the file so that you don't have to type the whole expression every time. And you can use them to simplify complex calculations. I'll give you examples of all that um, using my triathlon example again. So you find the user-defined fields and functions on the main window, user defined fields and functions. So here you see I have a relay event, a relay contest, where I have set up uh, the participants, the teams as one participant. 
Okay, then I have the team name and the second last name, first name, gender, and the third last name, first name, gender um, as ATFs. Because I have, I already have a gender field and a gender two and a gender three, I don't need to ask for the team gender because I can calculate it from gender, gender two and gender three. You'll see that here, team gender, here I have a nice switch function that just covers all the cases. During the training sessions, actually some of you have suggested ways of how I could even simplify this function, but um, here it is now, and it just covers all the cases. If it's all male, then the team is male. If all the gender fields are female, then it's female. If they're a mixture of male and female, then the team is mixed. Then to simplify um, expressions used throughout the file, uh, we had some functions already preset in the file. So for example, display name displays the first name and last name together, however you want it. So if we look at the lists, most of them are using display name. Okay, and you see here that um, first name is in uh, correct spelling and the last name is in uppercase. If I change it here to be also correct spelling, I need to only change it twice and then the change will be made in all the lists. Now we come to simplifying complex calculations and for that we will need not user-defined fields but user-defined functions. What's the difference? Here you see our user-defined fields. They're just fields calculated based on um, other sets of data. Here at the bottom, we've got user-defined functions and the difference is we've got parameters which we can set with that, with status x. So using this, um, so with status x and yes, no x are both um, standard uh, functions in the um, new templates and they allow you, for example, to show just any field um, if the status is regular or um, the status if it's not regular. So that's how here in our results at the bottom, we're showing here the rank for all the participants who finished the race with a regular status and the time, and we are showing the status for the participants who either were disqualified or did not finish using that with status function. Okay, the yes no function is a pretty um, nice one as well. So here we've got our t shirt yes no. And t-shirt returns what zero if it's um, not activated or one if it is activated. Okay, that's not very clear. So if you wanna make it a clear yes or no, all you need to do is call that yes, no function. I'm struggling with <laughs> Elliot's keyboard, fun times, and now this is turned to yes or no, and of course you can use that with any yes no field that is set up in the event file, just have to change the name here. All right, I'll jump ahead, I, was, I wanted to talk about um, outputs later, but I'll just make a quick uh, note because I'm here. So another best practice, it's better to, whenever possible, to use the uh, name of fields rather than their IDs because if someone doesn't know um, what AYN1 is, 
if one of my staff members just opens that file and wonders what it is, then he needs to look it up here on the side before he knows uh, that this is a t-shirt. I find it much better if you use the name and then it's pretty clear what AYN was one is because it's right under your nose. So back to user-defined fields and functions. Um, you see here there's a couple of uh, moderately um, complex ones. Maybe you're not familiar yet with the if, switch, and choose functions. If that's the case, I strongly recommend you to read the knowledge base. Um, so if you're in the user-defined fields and functions screen in the software, the knowledge base will actually prompt that article so you can read about user-defined fields and functions. Then if you jump um, one field back, one step back, you'll have here the whole article about fields, expressions, and functions. And I strongly recommend you to read it all because um, that will definitely help you in your daily operations and making them um, more efficient. Um, let's just take a quick break and ask Elliot if there's any questions I need to answer before moving to the timing side of things. Nope, we'll do. We'll get on time to. Nope. Then let's move ahead and go to timing points. Okay. So back to my, uh, what about timing points? First, I advise you to name them based on their geographical location. Um, then it's always good to upload your course files and place the timing points on the map so that you have a visual um, information about where's what and in which order the timing points are crossed. And then we'll talk briefly about automatic timing point selection, uh, which is a must if you're using the active system with loop boxes, but can also be um, useful with the passive system. So we'll cover that uh, all that now in order. Let's go. So timing points are set up under main window at the moment. They may move to the timing tab at some point. Okay. So here I have created um, for my triathlon a check-in timing point that's right before uh, people jump into water. I've got a transition in and transition out system and a finish system. Here, uh, why can't I scroll? Refresh. Oh yeah, my laptop does it sometimes. So here in the contest, I have uploaded my swim, bike, and run courses. So they're displayed here. And you see some dots as well uh, on the map. If you scroll down, that's my check-in, transition in, transition out, and finish timing points, which I have placed using this little hand here, um, and then you can just move the pin around. You can also set a color um, for each timing point. That's useful mainly in the timing tab because detections from uh, different timing points will be shown in different colors there. Um, I strongly advise you here to use bright colors uh, because if they are too dark, then you may not be able to read the black times there. Then here you have the map. So at the moment, I don't have any systems um, online. Uh, if I had, then I could just click the timing tab here and hover on my systems and they would be highlighted on the map and I would see it there. So I could check that they are actually placed at the right um, location. All right, now back to our timing points um, setup screen. 
here at the bottom, you see that automatic timing point selection, um, those settings, okay? So here you see I've assigned finish loop ID one, check in loop ID two, transition in loop ID three, transition out loop ID four. If I'm, if I'm using the active system with loop boxes, I have to do it because if I have a decoder at the finish and I simply connect my decoder to finish in the timing tab, then all the detections will go to um, the finish timing point. Then um, if I want to say that the loop box on loop ID2 is the check-in, that's how I need to do it. Um, even if you're not using loop boxes, um, it's good to do that even when you're using decoders because it might be that for whatever reason, the detection is stored um, at the timing point rather than delivered at the decoder it was supposed to be delivered to. And then you get it at the next decoder. Again, if you're uh, saying this decoder is finished and you get detections from a previous timing point, then um, it's not good. So assigning it there and not selecting a timing point in the timing tab ensures that all the detections uh, corresponding to a channel and loop ID go to the um, correct timing point. Now let's move to setting up your results. So a few recommendations as to results. Um, I would recommend you to always keep the finish result as ID number one, to define your start and finish results correctly in the contest settings. I'll show you how in a minute. Uh, to set up all your detections coming from the timing systems in chronological order with consecutive IDs. We'll see why as well. Uh, to leave gaps between blocks of results and to define a naming conven convention. Let's see why and how in my file. So keeping uh, finish ID, finish the finish result in ID one um, is good because first that's the default settings in the templates. So you don't have to change anything. And second, if you look at the results tab of a participant, then you see the most important times, his start uh, time of day and his finish race time right at the top, which is pretty practical. So back to those start and finish results. These are very um, important because mainly the finish result is used in your ranks as a filter. Okay, you get a rank if you're a finisher and you're only a finisher if you have a time stored in the in the result that is uh, set up as the finish result. Okay, then the start result uh, defines whether you're a starter or not. Have you if you have a time there, then you're considered as started. If you don't, you're not considered as started unless um, nothing is set up here and you have a finish result. Okay. So if you look at that overview um, window, the started count and the finished count here depends directly on uh, those results. Here I set up the last split ID. I could have set it up as my check-in time of day, but if for whatever reason someone doesn't check in and just starts, then um, he won't count as a starter and maybe I'll pick him up somewhere else and then I'll know he's started. So that's why I uh, tend to base it on last split ID. So anyone who's got a detection anywhere, not just at the check-in, will be a starter. Okay, I'll come back to that last split ID in a minute. In the results tab. So here we've got our finished result as ID number one. And then we've got all the detections coming in from timing systems in chronological order um, with consecutive IDs. Okay. Um, here I have named all my 
uh, th these are race times, so that's why they're called after swim, after transition one, after bike, after transition two, etc. Then I've got my um, leg times and my overall finish time, uh, just named for what they are. Okay, and I've got um, here my check-in time of day. Um, it's not a race time because it would be negative. It will be it should be before uh, T zero. So everything that's time of day, I tend to name it TOD. All right, and at the bottom, I've got two extra results: my last split ID and last split, built with aggregation formulas which you can find a helper for here and more information about um, in the knowledge base. These two results just give me an information about where the participant was detected last and at what time. So here that um, I've got my naming convention, convention and you can just have yours. It's just important that um, you have a clear way of um, making a difference between uh, leg times, um, race times, and other splits, and that it's clear for everyone in your team. It's also important to leave uh, gaps between your blocks of results, because maybe the organizer will say, oh, actually, I want um, a timing point to count laps. I've got two laps. Okay, then I can just add my run laps. And here, add a result 26. That will be my finish in the end. Timing point finish. And then this becomes after run lap one, at run laps, first read after T0. Okay, that's why you need to leave gaps between your blocks of results. Otherwise, you may not be able to move these down a bit further and to add some detections in between. OK, um, let's undo that. Or not. Finish. Finish. All right. Now, let's move to ranks. Same in ranks, you should have a naming convention. Um, as far as possible, uh, you should try and match your rank ID and with the result ID it is based on. For sorting, you should use only the decimal values on, uh, only. And use groupings wisely to uh, reduce the numbers, the number of uh, ranks that are necessary. So I'll give you some example again. So if we move to ranks here, at the top we see our um, standout ranks, overall rank, gender rank, age group rank. Then I set up an extra awards age group rank. And then I have a swim rank that's based on my swim time, result ID 11. Okay, so I have here ID 11, time positive 11, decimal time 11, then it's easy to match. I know that 11 is swim and it's everywhere the case. That has, um, it has other um, advantages which I'll come back later. Okay, and then the same for my after swim rank, after transition one rank, after bike rank, etc. That's all based on the same um, rank ID. Um, so grouping, so sorting um, only on decimal values. Why? Because if you use time, then that is a formatted time. So it's essentially a text string and it will sort participants by um, alphabetical order rather than by time order. I'll just demonstrate that in an output list. 
So if we look at our overall results, This here is time, and this here will be decimal time. So my time is a text string, and my decimal time is a number value. The order will most most probably be correct if you also use the time, but sometimes not. Um, so you don't want that. That's why for everything sorting, you need to use decimal time. Um, decimal time refers to the results that you have set up as the finished result. You can also call a decimal time 11, for example. That would be the swim time. And that's actually the same as T11. T11 and decimal time 11 will return the same. T11 is just shorter when you're using it in results calculation. That's why we have the shorter version here. Back to our ranks. Um, using groupings, you can save the trouble of uh, setting up a lot of ranks. So for example, here, by default, my gender rank would be based on gender. And for my relay, I would have to set up an extra rank just for the relay um, filter to just apply it to the relay. And then um, group by male, female, mixed. But because male, female, mixed actually sorts participants from the individual contest per male, female, and only um, the relays per male, female, mixed, I can use the same rank for the relays and for um, the individual contest. And then I have saved um, one rank setup. I hope this is clear. Um, and I'll keep on with the next topic, which is setting up output and online results. All right. So setting up your output and online results we do recommend you to keep number, the number of fields to a minimum. Use the field names rather than their IDs. I've talk about, talked about that earlier. Uh, if you keep the number of fields to a minimum, then you may want to display all the extra information, um, all splits and ranks in a details list. I'll show you how. Um, the record multiplier is a really good help here for details list. Uh, we'll talk about it later. You can also publish certificates and embed results on the events website. So let's show you how to do all that. So ideally, An output should only be four or five fields, okay? You'll have a rank, a bib, a name, and a time, maybe a club or a nation or something, but keep it to a minimum. Of course, for overall results here, we don't really, we can't really um, avoid, I'll just remove my demo fields. can't really avoid putting splits. That's pretty standard on a triathlon. But then I would avoid putting the ranks there and just put it, put them in, an, in um, a details list. So here I've got a details list. Which may look a bit strange when, you, when we look at it in the um, uh, back end. 
but basically what this does is it's just a multi-line report showing all the splits and all the places gained and uh, bits and pieces for every participant. And if I go to the myrestaurant.com settings, and set it up, set the details list as a details list. Um, then when I go to the results of my contest and click on a participant, this list will be displayed only for that participant. Um, setting up these details list can be a bit tricky. I'm in the wrong file. It can be very uh, time consuming to uh, create these as multi-line reports. And especially if you need a lot of lines, you may run out at some point because you have only 20 lines. To solve that problem, there's a very interesting feature called uh, the record multiplier. So here we're in the road nationals, uh, the road race in Australia, cycling this time. And um, the participants had to complete different numbers of laps. And the elite men, for example, had to complete uh, 16 laps. So here, I'll just find my detail list somewhere, lap details. Here the record multiplier is set to lap count. So all the participants who have completed their 16 laps will be displayed on 16 lines. And I've added something that shows a rabbit for the fastest lap and a tortoise for the slowest lap. Um, this is how it looks like online. All right. So the record multiplier was mainly set up for that. Okay, just display a lap ID, a lap time, uh, based on the, on the number of laps. But you can actually use it with um, our uh, nice functions to display whatever you want on different lines. So. Here's the details list for the Northman where we had 25 timing points. Gathering 22 splits um, for each participant. So here I just said I want 22 lines and then with the choose function on uh, the recall multiplier, I can define what's uh, displayed on each line and I'm able to create uh, details lists that are longer than um, 20 lines. All right, here we have at the same time an example of a certificate. That's always very appreciated by the participants, especially when they finish one of those events. Uh, they like to show it off. Just quickly to set up your certificates. You can create um, a layout in uh, the designer, then create a certificate set in the output window where you define who gets that certificate, uh, only finishers or only um, the top three, etc. And then in my.reshford.com, you can activate the certificates for um, a given contest. That's how it end up, ends up there. Okay, last feature, which, uh, which the um, uh, organizers usually really appreciate is um, embedding in your own website. So here we have those results on my.threshold.com. The organizer actually doesn't want um, to link to um, a third party page. Then you can provide him with this snippet of code, the results page, 
You can also embed the registration and the start list if you want. And then adding it to the source code of their website, the organizers can um, call the results straight from the page and style it as they want. And they can also make it multilingual. and compile results from previous years if you've also been timing the event in previous years. That was it on my side, so let's just stop again and ask if there's any other questions. Uh, um, yeah, just quickly, John, actually talk about putting images in is one of the questions that came up, just for the code we use. All right, so, so to add an image, there's different options. You can call an image that is in the file. Uh, where do I have an example of that? So here I have uploaded my hair and my turtle uh, as images, as icons there. And then I can call them uh, straight from the event file. Oh. <laughs> okay, let's start again because I was on the wrong file, on the wrong screen. So um, here in main window pictures, you can upload um, images, which then are available straight from the event file, even offline. So here my hair uh, comes straight from the event file. You can just that's the simply the simple version of it. Okay, if I show just hair, I will show my hair everywhere. Okay, so open the quotes, open the square brackets, IMG, um, two dots, then your file name, then that middle bar. And you can define a uh, height for the picture that will only apply for the preview because on the PDF it will depend on the line height. All right, I'm in a live event, so I'll just delete that. Um, the other option, if you don't want, for example, so here I'm using. Where, where, where? Here, start list. Here I'm using custom flags, um, SVG graphics that are standard width, like um, all fixed width, and they are hosted on the website um, server. Then you can also call these files from um, somewhere on the internet, but of course you need to have an internet connection for them to display. Did I answer the question? I think so. Any more questions? That's, that's all for today. All right, um, then let's call it a day. I hope that was useful and uh, thanks for watching and we'll see you at the next webinar. Bye.